And today we will continue to discuss the topic which we started to discuss at the end of the last lecture. So I will briefly, first of all, because a week uh, has elapsed since our last meeting, I will briefly remind the topic and then we will continue with the new material. So we started to discuss quite a general topic under this title, Spontaneous Symmetry Breaking in Nonlinear Dual Core Systems. And uh, well, I, uh, I already tried to explain, generally speaking, what it means. And we started to consider the first particular model, which is a relatively simple one, but non trivial. And it actually makes it possible, first of all, to uh, demonstrate a, um, a particular example of this phenomenon, the spontaneous symmetry breaking, in a rather simple form. So what we what already was introduced the last time, this model, this equation. So this equation is, a, as one can immediately understand, is a one-dimensional nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Uh, it is an equation with a cell cubic self-attractive self-attractive term. Why self-attractive? Because here it's written with minus, and according to the usual notation, it implies that this is a one-dimensional equation with a self-attraction, and in the free space, as it's commonly known, it gives rise to the famous soliton solutions, which are completely stable. But now, <clears throat> this is not free space because we assume that this equation is written for the infinitely deep potential box. It was already introduced the last time, and uh, as it's um, commonly known in quantum mechanics, if you want to consider a system in the infinitely deep potential box, and if we assume that uh, the coordinate x of the system is running between plus and minus l over 2, l is the size of the box, at the edges of the box, the boundary conditions are zero for the wave function. And then the value of the derivative of the wave function doesn't matter. So the only boundary condition that we should impo impose at edges of the box is that the wave function must vanish. And then we also have um, um, th this potential. The potential is inserted in the middle of the potential box, so it actually splits the box in two halves, and uh, epsilon is a positive parameter, and this, uh, because the epsilon is positive, obviously this is some potential barrier. So, and for the uh, some analytical approach, it may be convenient to assume the limit case when the potential barrier is infinitely tall and infinitely narrow, so that it is approximated by the delta, ideal mathematical delta function. And so this, uh, this uh, potential barrier splits the potential box into two mutually symmetric parts. And then we may have a stationary solution with particular components in both halves, in both parts of the system. And the uh, relevant question is that obviously we can always have symmetric solutions uh, with respect to the central point where we have the potential barrier. And of course, we may also have anti-symmetric solution. It's obvious that we may have symmetric and anti-symmetric solutions because if we just try to solve the same problem in the framework of the linear quantum mechanics, obviously the um, eigenstates, the bound states will be either uh, spatially even, symmetric, or spatially odd anti-symmetric. So there is a theorem in quantum mechanics that only in the case of the symmetric potential, we may have only symmetric or anti-symmetric states, and the ground state, the one with the lowest energy, is always symmetric, and then the first excited state is anti-symmetric, and then we have the alternation of symmetric and anti-symmetric anti bound states. In linear quantum mechanics, this is a textbook material. Now, the situation may be different because we have the self-attractive nonlinearity. So this is where I mentioned already where this model was introduced, and now this is a schematic plot. Boris? Yes. Boris? Yes, why yes. In the, yes. Why tangy does not appear in the boundary condition? In the what last about phase, boundary? In the, in the, the last, last phase, uh, yes. yes, in the last, yes. 
time t does not uh, appear in the boundary condition y you just ah, write, so uh, like, oh. you mean here here no here after I mean, is, after one half should be t since just since a that is a function of x and t uh, just a second uh, what, uh, what does it, actually, first of all yes. i see here a typo because here is L and here is one. Actually, uh, well, it's already but, written here that L is set equal to one. Therefore, this L should be also one. And what is it? There's no T. There's not uh, the time. Not, uh, no, the time does not appear in, in boundary conditions. The boundary can, it's, it's the same boundary condition as in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, uh, irrespective of if you try to solve, it, let us assume that this is a usual. Linear so, Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics without this term, and then it's uh, commonly known that if you want to consider, let me. So this is the scale no, of the potential. What, what, no, what I wanted to say is why the why you you, you have no root uh, side of x t equal to zero one one x equal to plus or minus l by two. Since since the so, function the, the wave function. Psi yes. is a function of x and t. Y but yes. Ah, okay. Yes. Maybe. Okay. Maybe you mean why the argument t is not written t. here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. The, okay. This is uh, this is actually the um, uh, first of all. But by the way, I said this was a typo. I'm sorry. <laughs> I looked very uh, too too fast. Uh, there is no typo. It's simply written that uh, is, it's it's correct because we said that L, by by rescaling we said that L is equal to one. Therefore, what is written in the argument in terms of x is correct. There is no typo. Now, of course, psi may also be a function of time. It's simply not exactly. explicitly written. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, of course, what it is implied that generally speaking, if you want to solve the uh, to find the non-stationary solution, which explicitly depends on time. Uh, psi may be a function of time, but nevertheless, the boundary conditions remain exactly so the same. So it be equal to zero. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So therefore, I didn't write explicitly T as an mm -hmm. argument, but exactly. because it is implied. Exactly. That's what I asked. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay. Okay, okay now I, I hope it's clear. And as I said, sorry for um, uh, a misleading statement. There is no typo. I just looked too fast at it. Everything is yeah, correct. Yeah. What is written here is correct. Okay. Exactly. And then, okay. Now, this is once again the schematic illustration. So, uh, this infinite, infinitely tall potential, uh, potential wall on the left and right sides implies that this is indeed the infinitely deep potential well. What is, is, this is how it's usually called in quantum mechanics. And uh, this, is, this is actually, this fact imposes zero boundary conditions. Then this is schematically shown central potential barrier. As I said, in the um, analytical model, it's simply the delta function. Of course, we cannot uh, plot the delta function. Therefore, we approximate, instead of the delta function, what is plotted here is uh, some uh, tall uh, potential barrier with a, a, a large height and relatively small widths, but we, which approximates the delta function. And now these um, color uh, curves, they show, as I mentioned already the last time, they show possible, uh, possible configurations of the stationary states that we may expect to exist in this system. And actually what we would like to do to understand the structure of such uh, bound states. So first of all, it's obvious that we may have asymmetric bound states. So schematically, the symmetric bound state is shown by the red uh, curve. And of course, it should have some local minimum at the center, at the central point, because at the center, we have the uh, uh, repulsive potential. So therefore, it, can, it, should, uh, it should impose some minimum, um, uh, minimum value of, of, the, of the wave function. Then, as, as is, uh, it is clearly suggested by the comparison with quantum mechanics, uh, if the, the ground state, for example, will be uh, something like this symmetric wave function, the first excited state in quantum mechanics must automatically be an anti-symmetric wave function. And this is a schematically, this blue curve <coughs> shows an, um, schematically possible anti-symmetric wave function, which vanishes at the center. But a new fact, which is not possible in quantum mechanics, but is possible in the nonlinear system, 
when instead of the linear Schrodinger equation, we have the non-linear Schrodinger equation with a self-attraction, is that if the norm uh, of the wave function is large enough, in other words, if the nonlinear terms is sufficiently strong, then we may have a completely new state, asymmetric state, is schematically shown by this green curve, which will have a maximum only in one half of the uh, one uh, section, one half of the system, and will and will take much smaller values in the other uh, in the other section. So what we mean by the spontaneous symmetry breaking is a possibility that the system may generate this asymmetric solution. Spontaneously means that it's simply generated by the system uh, from some initial conditions. And, and symmetry breaking means that in this case of the strong symmetry breaking, we explicitly have the maximum and the much larger values of the wave function in one section, for example, on the right side, and much smaller values without any local maximum on the left side. So now we will try to understand if this is really, if this intuitive expectation really happens, and we may really have such uh, solutions that, of course, it will be because the system is nonlinear. It's quite important to understand what solutions may be stable and what solutions are unstable. Okay, so <clears throat> as I also mentioned probably the last time, uh, let, let us repeat it briefly now. Uh, mathematically speaking, we would like to find the um, uh, stationary solutions, eigenstates, as it's called in quantum mechanics. So mu in quantum mechanics, it's simply the eigenvalue of the energy here. It is Mu is written because it may be also considered as a gross petayevsky equation for the Bose-Einstein condensate. So in the mean field approximation, it's actually not a problem for a single particle, but it's a, uh, it's a problem for the gas of particles. Then mu is called usually the chemical potential. Then we substitute this um, expression for the wave function into the underlying equation, into this nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Obviously, we arrive at the stationary equation, which is written here. And now we can assume that this fu uh, stationary function phi is purely real. Therefore, just the third power of phi is written without the absolute value. And the boundary conditions remain the same as before, of course. Phi must vanish at edges because we have the infinitely deep potential <coughs> well and a potential box. And then uh, if we want, first of all, to address this uh, model with the ideal delta function, uh, we see that there is no potential at finite values of x different from zero. And exactly uh, um, in the infinitely small vicinity of zero, there, it's well known how to uh, take into regard the presence of the delta function. We should perform the integration of the stationary equation in the infinitely small vicinity of point x equal to zero. And when we perform the integration, uh, the integral over the infinitely small vicinity of these regular terms will give zero. And uh, the integral of the second derivative will give, because the second derivative is a full derivative of the first derivative, we will have the difference of values of the first derivative. So the first derivative may have a jump due to the presence of the delta function. It's necessary to stress once again that the wave function itself is continuous. It has no jump, but its first derivative may have a jump. And then the size of the jump is that is found, as I said, if we perform the integration of this equation over the infinitely small vicinity of point x equal to zero, roughly speaking from something uh, x equal to minus epsilon up to plus epsilon with very small epsilon, then the, this integral will give us this jump of the, of the first derivative. And on the other hand, of course, the integral of the delta function is simply one. Therefore, we will obtain this. Uh, we can say that this is the internal boundary condition in addition to the external boundary conditions within here. And this internal boundary condition, the condition for the jump of the first derivative, it actually uh, replaces the presence of the delta functional potential in the equation. The, uh, here is, is in this jump condition, we should write the value of the wave function at x equal to zero, but it makes no problem to write it because as I said, the, uh, the phi itself is continuous. So its value is well-defined. 
uh, what uh, demonstrates as a jump is not phi, but it's first derivative. Okay, so this is a mathematical problem to solve this ordinary differential equation with this set of boundary conditions. And uh, analytically, it's not possible to find the exact solution, but uh, it's possible to develop the analytical approach. I also probably very briefly mentioned this at the very end of the last lecture, namely, we can uh, notice that these equations that we want to solve, including uh, the presence of the delta functional potential, this equation can be derived from the, its natural Lagrangian. So Lagrangian is written here, it has the integral terms. The integral terms, they correspond to these three terms in the equation. And the last term is not integrable, it's just the explicitly taken value of the square of phi at x equal to zero, because it's produced, formally it's also an integral term, but it's, uh, this integral includes delta of x, therefore the integration is performed trivially, and we just obtain this extra term produced by the Pot internal pot uh, delta functional potential, just as in this purely local form without any integration. Now, according to the uh, general principles of the variation approximation, we should adopt what is called the ansatz, the trial wave function. And the simplest possibility is written here. So we can take the combination of cosines and sines. Of course, we should select uh, the arguments, uh, for example, here is pi, here is the coefficient is pi, here is 3 pi, here 2 pi, but this is the argument of sine rather than of cosine, because automatically each term must satisfy these boundary conditions at the edges of the potential box. So this, uh, each term is a wave function must vanish if we want to be sure that the entire wave fun function vanishes. Uh, <clears throat> then with uh, A, B, and C are arbitrary coefficients, which we should find from the variation approximation. And now the meaning of all this approximation is the first two terms obviously represent even functions. So they are going to somehow approximate the symmetric wave function. But the third term, it also satisfies the boundary conditions, but it is anti-symmetric. And if we will have a solution in which B, the amplitude in front of this term is different from zero, uh, the entire wave function will become asymmetric because it will be a mixture of symmetric and anti-symmetric terms and the appearance, the emergence of such a term with non-zero B will imply that we have what is called the bifurcation, the transition from the symmetric solution to an asymmetric one. And this is exactly what is called the spontaneous symmetry breaking, the appearance of such non-trivial asymmetric solutions. Uh, and by the way, should, what should be also mentioned is the fact that obviously this ansatz does not agree with this internal boundary condition because internal boundary condition implies that we should have a jump of the first derivative at point x equal to zero. However, obviously the answer does not have any jump. All terms are contained, not only these terms themselves, but also their first derivatives as functions of x, they all are continuous at x equal to zero, which simply means that the answer is not very accurate. It actually does not take into regard the presence of the jump, but nevertheless, it makes sense to try to, uh, to analyze the answers and see what it will predict, because it, uh, what, is, what we should really try to predict, even if we cannot exactly take into regard the presence of the jump, is the transition from symmetric to asymmetric solutions. And as we will see, although this answer is not very accurate, it's, it, it, it makes it possible to predict this uh, phenomenon. So what we do technically, we substitute the answers into the Lagrangian, we simply sub uh, calculate explicitly. It means calculate the integral, the values, the value of this Lagrangian. So we obtain the Lagrangian in the framework of the variation approximation as an explicit sim simple polynomial function of three parameters, A, B, and C. And then we write the standard system of the variational, or in other words, Euler Lagrange equations. We demand that for the approximate stationary solution, the deri first derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to all the three parameters must be simultaneously equal to zero. So this will give us obviously a system of three coupled algebraic equations for A, B, and C, because 
we have quartic terms, it will be a system of three coupled cubic equations, which should be solved numerically, which is quite easy to do. And we will obtain some results, which I will show in a minute. But also uh, I mentioned that there is another analytical approximation, much simpler one. Uh, we can just explicitly develop the uh, asymptotic analysis of this equation, assuming that epsilon is a very large parameter. So after some technical details, which I will not, uh, not present here, it, it's because they are rather boring, it, it will take too much time. Uh, this uh, limit case of very large epsilon produces um, the approximate results, in particular, uh, how we can represent these results. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in, part we, um, in, in particular, we will, uh, we will see that the, uh, in, in, in this limit of very large epsilon, what it means physically, very large epsilon means that this potential barrier is very tall. It, it means that the, um, it means that the, uh, this potential box is split by very tall potential barrier into two um, uh, half boxes, which have very, very weak, very, which are coupled, which uh, are coupled by very weak uh, tunneling across the potential barrier. So we split the system almost completely into two almost isolated subsystems with very weak remaining uh, linkage or coupling between them. Okay, so uh, in this limit case, uh, the, the analytical approximation predicts that uh, the ground state, that first of all, of course, we would like to find the ground state, which uh, provides the minimum energy, so it will uh, predict the ground state with this particular value of the total norm. The norm is defined here. It's an obvious definition of the norm of the wave function. And with this, this is a particular value of the eigen, uh, eigen uh, well value in terms of quantum mechanics energy or in terms of the Bose-Einstein condensate, the chemical potential for the ground state as a function of so this is an eigen value as a function of epsilon. Uh, okay, and then if we want to characterize eventually the asymmetry, when we obtain the asymmetric uh, solution, uh, we will, uh, it's how we can characterize it. I already mentioned the last time, but let us repeat it. It's an important and simple point. Uh, when we define the total norm of this uh, wave function, we can explicitly separate it into two parts, which correspond to the uh, uh, right and left. Um, segments or sections of the system, ha half boxes. And then uh, if this we can find, so for the obviously for the symmetric or anti-symmetric state, these partial norms are exactly equal. However, if, if uh, the analysis will predict eventually the asymmetric state, the asymmetric state, first of all, is characterized by the difference if, in the two norms. Why we should expect it? Let us look again at the schematic picture. Obviously, if we try to, to compute the norm for this asymmetric uh, wave function represented by the green line, obviously the norm here and norm here are very different. So in that case, we can introduce as a standard measure of the asymmetry, this parameter is called theta, the difference between the two partial norms divided by the total norm for the, just for normal, for the, uh, to reproduce it in the naturally scaled for this parameter state as a measure of the asymmetry. Okay, and now this is the result, the first result. This result shows what is usually called the bifurcation diagram or symmetry breaking diagram. So this is exactly this asymmetry measure of theta. It is, it is shown as a function of the total norm n and all this is shown for the ground state of the system. So for the eigenstate for the wave function, which uh, gives rise to the lowest value of the energy or chemical potential. So what happens can be clearly seen in this picture. For relatively small values of the norm, roughly speaking from zero to something like five, we uh, say it is equal to zero. It means that the ground state remains symmetric as it would be in the case of the linear Schrodinger equation. So the nonlinearity is not strong enough in this case to break the symmetry. Now the symmetry breaking spontaneously occurs at this particular critical value of the norm. And then 
the symmetric solution keeps uh, to exist for larger values of n, it's shown by this dotted line, but it, it, it becomes now unstable. It is destabilized by this, what is called the symmetry breaking bifurcation. Simultaneously, we obtain a new solution. The new solution uh, is characterized by the non-zero value of theta. Actually, strictly speaking, of course, we obtain two new solutions because we obviously we can have the solution with theta and then the solution was minus theta, which means in terms of the schematic picture, if we have this green asymmetric state, of course, we also have another state, which would be just its mirror image with respect to x equal to zero. Uh, but it makes sense to show only one, uh, one curve because the other will be just its mirror image. We would not show anything new. Now, the continuous curve shows the result of the full numerical solution of this uh, problem. And not only this uh, numerical solution for the shape of this uh, wave function as a ground state, but also the fact that it is shown by the continuous curve implies that it is stable. It can be also checked numerically that it is stable against small perturbations. Now the dashed line simultaneously shows the prediction of this variational approximation. So just uh, taking this euler lagrange equations, we can solve them numerically, we can then calculate uh, this, this, this way, we can reproduce the approximate wave function, which is predicted by the variation approximation, calculate its norm, and eventually uh, produce for the variation approximation, the value of theta as it is predicted by this approximation. And we see that the analytical approximation for the asymmetry is practically identical to the complete numerical solution. So in this sense, this simple variation approximation is quite accurate. And even if, as I stressed, the variational answers ignores the presence of the jump of the first derivative at x equal to zero, in spite of this inaccuracy, the prediction of this bifurcation diagram provided by the variational approximation is quite accurate. Next, <coughs> we can uh, actually, I guess this was the the last plot, which was shown at the very at the last minute of the uh, uh, week ago, it makes it uh, make sense to discuss it again. Um, we can uh, present the results in a different form uh, because, uh, <coughs> excuse me, if we vary the value of n, it's a norm, the to of the total norm of the wave function. Obviously, we will accordingly uh, vary due to the nonlinearity the eigenvalue of the uh, ground state or the chemical potential mu will depend on n. And so here, the solutions of the same problem are shown in terms of the dependence between uh, n and mu. So if, to compare it with the previous plot, here also uh, n is uh, varying. And of course, along this curve, we will have the values of the chemical potential. Simply the chemical potential is not shown in this plot, but it is shown here. Okay, so what we can see, the mm, uh, continuous curve shows the ground state of the system as found from the numerical solution. And again, here from, uh, uh, so, so here we can see something quite similar to what we saw in the previous plot. In the previous plot, we see that when n took values between zero and roughly speaking five, we had the symmetric ground state. Here we, we see the same, when n takes values on this axis. Between zero and five, we have this segment, which actually implies that it is a stable. Uh, by definition, it, it shows the stable uh, symmetric ground state, and, and it still remains stable. Now, th this is a critical point at n equal to five, the same critical point that we saw here, the same one, uh, where we have the onset of the spontaneous symmetry breaking. So here, uh, from uh, across this point, we can continue. Uh, we can continue by this dotted line. We can continue the numerically found uh, symmetric state, but it, it is now unstable, not so interesting. And we have a new solution, which is represented by the continuous line, which which exactly corresponds to the new asymmetric stable ground state obtained from the numerical solution. Now, simultaneously. These two dust curves, they show the prediction of the variational approximation. So first of all, this, um, uh, this 
top uh, dashed curve, it shows the prediction of the variation approximation for this unstable symmetric uh, solution beyond the symmetry breaking point. So we see that here the prediction is quite accurate, although it's not very interesting simply because it predicts all accurately, but it predicts the AC, uh, unstable solution. Now this uh, bottom dashed curve shows what is predicted by the variation approximation for the, sim for the asymmetric stable uh, ground state. Now we see that it is, this prediction is less accurate. There is some discrepancy between the numerically found ground state and the variationally predicted one, but still uh, overall, the prediction is maybe called reasonable taking into regard that it is uh, actually, it was based on, on a rather primitive uh, uh, ansatz. Uh, principle that can be improved if more terms are included, but of course then technically all the analysis will be much more cumbersome and maybe it is not worthy the, uh, the effort. Okay, now this is uh, to further illustrate the variational approximation and the numerical, the full numerical solutions. These are particular examples of the bound states, which are uh, both produced as numerical solutions and are predicted by the variational approximation. So this uh, here we take a particular particular values of, par of the parameters epsilon. The strength of the potential barrier is three, and the total norm is ten, according to uh, <clears throat> is here, this, all this plot also was produced for epsilon equal to three. So we see here that if n is equal to 10, we conclude that the symmetric uh, wave function is definitely unstable. And what is stable is uh, sufficiently strongly asymmetric one. Now we can see examples of that. Uh, for this uh, values of the parameters, these are unstable symmetric bound state. So again, the continuous uh, curve shows the, the result of the numerical solution and the dashed line shows, the dashed curve shows the variation approximation. So here, actually, we should mention that uh, we definitely have, as I said, the numerical solution, we definitely observe a local minimum at x equal to zero, which is very natural because we have the, um, uh, the presence of the repulsive potential barrier here, but strictly speaking, we don't see here any jump as derivative. And the first derivative remains continuous. The point is why it remains continuous because if we want to, to obtain the numerical solution, is that for the numerical solution, we cannot use the ideal delta function. So what was used to produce a numerical solution, it was not the ideal delta function, it was some approximate, standard approximation for the delta function in terms of some narrow, usually it's a Gaussian approximation, some Gaussian function with a sufficiently small width and large amplitude, and it satisfies the normalization condition, uh, which actually is, exa is exactly the same as for the delta function. But in that case, of course, when we use this approximation for the delta function, there is no reason to expect that we really have the jump of the first derivative. Everything remains continuous and smooth. Okay, and <clears throat> now what is more interesting actually is to look at this right panel because this panel shows the stable uh, asymmetric ground state, which we have in this case for these parameters. And once again, the, we see the continuous curve and we see the dust curve. The continuous curve shows the numerical solution. The dust curve shows the variation approximation. We see that of course there is some discrepancy but it's not large, and it implies that this quite simple variation approximation makes sense. It predicts something which is not, which is relatively close to the numerically exact results, so it is usable. Okay, now another illustration of what happens here, dynamical illustration. So once again, if we have exactly the same case as shown here, and as I said, we definitely expect that this, uh, let us now we're talking only about this, this, this uh, numerical solution. This numerical solution is definitely unstable. And now this particular simulation illustrates how this um, instability develops. So the input is, is shown by this, um, by this bold black curve. It is exactly the numerically found uh, unstable 
symmetric bound state. And then uh, we run the sim simulation of the full time dependent nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and it demonstrates this result, namely, due to uh, actually here no explicit perturbations are introduced. The perturbations are introduced simply by small um, um, truncation errors of the numerical scheme. And is this, this uh, intrinsic, uh, very small um, numeric, this very weak numerical noise is sufficient to initiate the development of the instability of this input. And we see that the instability actually uh, uh, indeed uh, it, it tends to transform the symmetric input into a strongly asymmetric solution. So we see that it uh, spontaneously makes uh, the um, value of the uh, wave function of density it's the absolute value of the wave function. The absolute value of the wave function in one uh, section of this, uh, this, in this case, it's uh, left. In the left section of the box, spontaneously, the wave, the amplitude becomes much larger. In the other, it becomes much smaller. So this is exactly the dynamical realization of the spontaneous symmetry breaking. Of course, uh, is, is, uh, the, this dynamical evolution will not produce exactly the stationary state because this is, a, a, by definition, what we obtain here is not a stationary solution. We obtain some solution with some internal dynamics, with some internal oscillations, but still it's overall shape, although it's not, uh, at this later stage of the evolution, it's not very clearly seen as a figure. Nevertheless, it's easy to understand that it's quite overall, it's quite similar, sorry, it's quite similar to this strongly asymmetric configuration. Okay, now, we can summarize these results. Now we can ask the following question. Okay, let us take different values of our control parameter is epsilon. Epsilon is the strength of the um, uh, central uh, potential barrier. Maybe let us look once again at the original equation. So the original equation uh, is, is, is here. So this is as a, because we, we normalize uh, the um, the size of the potential box to be one. Epsilon is a single control parameter in this model. And now we can ask the question: Okay, if we have uh, effects such as spontaneous symmetry breaking, for example, here for epsilon equal to three, uh, we see that the spontaneous symmetry breaking sets in as a particular critical value, bifurcation value of n, which is close to five. And then uh, to characterize the entire system, it will be natural to collect the numerical data and predict uh, what will be the critical value of n of this point of the spontaneous symmetry breaking as a function of epsilon. So these results, which uh, provides a summary of all the, of the entire analysis, they are shown in this plot. So this is this uh, bifurcation value of n, a critical value at the point of the symmetry breaking, versus or the function of the control parameter epsilon. And <clears throat> so it starts actually not exactly, uh, the, uh, 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 okay, yes. And then uh, um, and actually values of n start from zero, but values of epsilon, it's, uh, it's, it's not explicit. The first value of epsilon is not explicitly written, but you can see that actually, the, uh, you, you can see that at this point, at this point, the value of the, of the bifurcation parameter is still finite, it's not infinitely large, which means that this first value of epsilon is, non, is not zero, because at, if epsilon is equal to zero, we should not have, of course, any spontaneous symmetry breaking, which formally means that the critical value of n will become infinite. But here, actually, uh, it is, this plot is, um, is um, confined to this uh, interval because when Epsilon is very close to zero, the critical value of n becomes very large. It, it, it may be difficult to uh, extend this plot uh, so that the value of n will be very accurate. Okay, so this is the, character is the overall characteristic of the system. Now, this is a numerically found dependence between n and epsilon. And uh, this dashed curve, once again, shows the prediction provided by the variation approximation. So we see that, of course, there is, as they intersect only at one point somewhere here at epsilon close to two maybe. Uh, otherwise, there is some discrepancy. 
Sometimes the variation approximation predicts the critical value, which is larger than the numerical value, sometimes smaller. But uh, overall, it's, uh, it gives a correct qualitative picture of the variation approximation. Now we see that the accuracy of the variation approximation deteriorates for large values of epsilon. And it's not difficult to understand why, because uh, as this was too simple, in particular, it ignored, the, uh, as I mentioned already, <clears throat> the, the jump of the first derivative or something which is similar to the jump. At, uh, at uh, x equal to zero, but when epsilon is very, very large, this feature, this jump or quasi jump, becomes actually very salient, very strong feature, and therefore the answer becomes quite inaccurate. Therefore, for very large values of epsilon, the variation approximation becomes inaccurate. However, we have another analytical approximation which I mentioned for large values of epsilon. So we see that when epsilon is not very large, this approximation is quite inaccurate, but as we increase epsilon gradually, we see that the, this large epsilon approximation becomes closer to the numerical approximation, and therefore it becomes usable for really very large values of epsilon. Okay, <clears throat> now there is another interesting thing that we can consider in the framework of exactly the same model, because thus far we were talking only about the ground state. So the ground state is a solution with the lowest energy. And in this case of the, Z, uh, the linear <coughs> equation, or in the case of weak nonlinearity, it, it, it is represented by the symmetric wave function. And later it uh, undergoes the symmetry breaking. Uh, later, I mean, for larger, for the stronger nonlinearity. However, the, uh, as we know from quantum mechanics, the infinitely deep potential, uh, potential box has actually an infinite spectrum of balanced states. And then it may be interesting also to consider what happens to the first excited state above the ground state. So it will be, in, according to the general principle of quantum mechanics, in the linear limit, it will be automatically an anti-symmetric wave function. And now the question is what will happen in our model with the first excited state? Actually, if we have the model with the ideal delta function, we can immediately understand that the stationary solution for all anti-symmetric bound states, including the first excited states, are simply exactly the same as they were in the linear limit. Why it's obvious? Because uh, let us look again at our model with the ideal delta function. This is a stationary equation. What we see, uh, if we want to find the solution with the anti-symmetric phi, of course, the anti-symmetric or odd function automatically vanishes at x, x equal to zero. But the entire barrier is placed also at x equal to zero, which means simply that for any anti-symmetric bound state, this entire term vanishes, becomes equal to zero. And therefore, uh, we will have actually the same situation which we have in the absence of any potential barrier. Uh, well, I, I said actually that the same is in, um, in the case of the linear Schrodinger equation, of course, it's not correct because we still have the nonlinear term. But I mean, in the in the case uh, when we want to find any bound state which is anti-symmetric, it will be exactly the same as its counterpart uh, in this potential box without any splitting potential. Uh, <clears throat> so in that sense, uh, we can say that the presence of the splitting potential provides no effect. However. What is also important is not only to obtain the stationary shape of this anti-symmetric um, excited state, but it's also important to uh, explore its stability. And stability, for the stability, the presence of the potential becomes essential because uh, we may have in particular small perturbations which, are, which do not vanish at x equal to zero. There is no reason to assume that. Uh, small perturbations must also vanish at x equal to zero. Therefore, they, uh, the result of the analysis will be definitely sense of the stability analysis will be sensitive to the presence of this uh, delta functional barrier. And, the, and therefore, what will happen eventually, the result of the, uh, new, actually, this is only the numerical investigation without an analytical approximation. If we, if we keep increasing the value of n of the norm. In other words, we increase the effective strength of the nonlinearity. What happens to the anti-symmetric states 
is shown by this plot. The plot shows the uh, dependence between the uh, chemical potential, in other words, the eigenvalue of the energy for this first excited state and <coughs> the total norm. So first of all, this is, it. of course, <coughs> this eigenvalue is always higher than the eigenvalue for the ground state because it's the excited state. And then we see that up to some finite, when n varies, uh, actually here it's, uh, it's very static somewhere from here because it, so here we have this this uh, uh, this uh, line starts from some finite value of n, not from n equal to zero. But if we take smaller values of n, we will have just the extension of this uh, curve, which is not very interesting. And the continuous form, the, the fact that it's shown by the continuous curve implies that uh, up to this critical point. This is a family of stable solutions. So up to this point where the nonlinearity becomes strong enough, uh, the anti-symmetric excited states are stable. Now, something trivial happens at this value of n, namely the anti-symmetric state becomes unstable against small perturbations. And therefore, it's still uh, the family of these anti-symmetric solutions can be extended. It is extended by the dotted line, but it, it is now completely unstable. And uh, simultaneously, for comparison, uh, the same results which we already discussed for the ground states are also included. So for the ground states, the symmetry breaking point is here, and as we discussed it already, then the symmetric ground state will be formally extended, but as an unstable solution. And then we have here the appearance of the new asymmetric uh, stable ground state, which is a true ground state of the system. Uh, beyond the uh, symmetry breaking point. Uh, <clears throat> in particular, here we have some, re so here we have up to this point, we have, in terms of the total set, uh, full set of these two solutions, we have the bistability. Both, of, both solutions for these values of, chemical, of the chemical potential, they may coexist. Or in other words, there is some interval of the norm uh, between this, I be actually below this point, where there is uh, bistability in terms of the norms. For the same norm, we may have uh, both the, uh, the ground state is stable against small perturbations and the first excited state is stable. Now, at this point where the anti-symmetric state becomes unstable, the the, uh, there is no bifurcation in the sense here. Here we saw that the uh, unstable um, symmetric state was replaced by the newly appearing st uh, stable Asymmetric one. Here we have simply the loss of stability of the antisymmetric state, but no uh, additional, at least no visible additional uh, uh, stable solution appears, which would replace the uh, the, stay, the unstable uh, antisymmetric grounds, uh, not grounds, the first excited state. So this is Boris. Boris. Yes. Boris. Yes. Uh -huh. Please, uh, I would like to know how you measure the stability in terms of the splitting the, barrier. The stability was the, the ter determined from the numerical solution. Actually, it was the, uh, identified as it's usually done by means of two different methods. First, it's possible, so to say, more uh, more systematic and more accurate method. We can take this full time-dependent equation from which we started the model. The equation is written, is written, is written, not here, but uh, previously here, right? We can then write the system of linearized equations for the small perturbations. In, in the studies of both Einstein condensates, usually the system of linearized equations is called the system of Bagalub of the Gen equations. And then uh, if we have the numerically exact uh, stationary solution, it is possible to solve numerically the, uh, the linearized equations for the small perturbations and identify uh, eigenvalues of small perturbations and the eigenvalues, they determine if we have the instability or not. So if there is a, um, in, a instability growth rate as, I, as an eigenvalue of that linear system with a non-zero real, real part, it means that we have the instability. If all 
instability, if all eigenvalues for the linearized equations are completely imaginary, it means we have neutral stability. On, and then uh, another approach, which is illustrated, was already illustrated actually by one plot here. It's illustrated by, the, by this plot. Um, more straightforward approach is once we can find from the stationary, from the numerical solution of the stationary equation, we can obtain the solution. We can just try to use it as the input for the time dependent equation, run direct simulations and see what will happen. So if it is stable, it will simply keep its shape. If it is unstable, we will see something like what we observe here. It will spontaneously start to change and the system will de definitely uh, demonstrate its uh, trend to replace this unstable solution by some new solution. Particularly in this case, the system wants to replace the unstable symmetric state by the stable asymmetric one. Okay, so this is how the stability was identified. So the stability okay. is uh, according to the shape of the of the, the wave function? Well, of course, we for first we find stationary solutions we take with a particular shape. When we find them as stationary solutions, we don't know if they are stable or not. And then we, uh, in the simplest case, what we do, we run direct simulations using these uh, shapes as in initial conditions. And we try to see if the direct simulation will uh, demonstrate that the system keeps uh, this input or it starts to destroy it, which implies that they are unstable. Okay, okay. Nathan okay. is also asking a question about... Yes. Uh, Nathan is asking a question through, through charge. What question? He's asking about the... Let me see if I can have... Uh, Nathan, can you ask your question aloud? So, uh, my question is that what will happen if we had a double barrier of potential? If we have what potential? If we had a double barrier, double barrier ah. of potential. Uh, double barrier? You ask double, double barrier. barrier? Once again, what barrier? Double barrier? Double barrier of potential. Because double the barrier result. Of barrier. Yes, double barrier. Uh, okay, so I'm not sure that I understood. Double barrier, double well. Double yes. well, double well, okay. Double, double well, well, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. If if, uh, if we have the the double well, this situation will be um, um, situation will be different. Actually, we will. I'm. You know what? It makes sense to discuss this issue a little bit later, because this is what another topic we, which will be included hopefully still today. And th therefore, it will be much easier to, to discuss it, because later we will have a direct illustration of exactly this case with a double barrier. A double, okay. so, sorry, double potential well. So we will yes. have a chance to discuss it directly. Let us postpone this, okay? Okay, sir. Because it will be explicitly included. <laughs> okay, and finally, Yes, the last, uh, the last illustration of this particular uh, model is the, the summary of the results. This time, uh, the, uh, so we already discussed the summary of the results for, this, uh, for the stability and instability of the ground state. Uh, but now we also may produce a similar picture, which is, summarizes the results of the analysis of the stability for the first excited state, the anti-symmetric state. The picture is very simple. Uh, it, this is a curve in this plane of the control parameter epsilon. It is uh, strength, or as I said many times, strength of the central splitting potential uh, barrier, potential barrier, and the total norm. And uh, so, what we should excuse, uh, what actually what we should uh, expect from this plot is uh, for some particular value of epsilon. Here, epsilon is fixed to be three. When the norm becomes too large, in other words, once again, the nonlinearity becomes too strong, the first excited state will become unstable. So we should expect the transition from stability to instability with the increase of n at fixed epsilon. And this is exactly what we can see from this diagram. We can fix any value of epsilon, the respective 
there is some respect to critical point when norm takes values below this critical point. The, the first excited anti-symmetric state is stable. Above this critical value, it becomes unstable. So in particular, if we take epsilon equal to three, we will have the particular value of norm, which corresponds, at the, roughly speaking, something like uh, between 15 and, and 15 and 20, is the same critical point, which we can see in this example. Okay, um, now let us proceed to a new, uh, an, another particular model, which also is an important example of the spontaneous symmetry breaking. This is, uh, uh, well, the, the, let me remind that the, to, the, the general title of this uh, large topic, that, uh, which is a subject now, is spontaneous symmetry breaking in the dual core systems. So the previous model, in a sense, was also dual core, in the sense that this potential barrier splits the potential, uh, potential, uh, po <clears throat> it splits the potential box into two, uh, into two boxes, which are separated by the barrier. But now we, we can see another model, which literally demonstrates the, the structure built of two cores. Okay, so this is uh, something which uh, is a very important, it finds very important realizations in optics. In optics, in many cases, people are dealing with so-called couplers. And the couplers, this means in fiber optics, we have two parallel optical fibers, this one and this one, and they're separated by some dielectric barrier. However, photons can actually uh, tunnel, can jump across uh, this barrier from one core into the other core. So we have, generally speaking, in terms of optics, we have two parallel waveguides. In particular, this may be optical fibers, or uh, this may be also planar waveguides parallel to each other. And they're separated by the barrier. However, the barrier is uh, penetrable, and therefore light can actually demonstrate some um, uh, under barrier, under barrier, uh, tunneling between two cores. Uh, so, uh, so in optics, such structure is usually called the coupler because it provides for the coupling between the light which propagates in the two wave guides. And this is a very important setup in optics and it has actually very important uh, practical applications. So there is actually a real industry which produces all kinds of uh, couplers in optics, but it should be also mentioned that now we are going to discuss the dynamics of a coupler in the nonlinear uh, situation, while in practical applications in optics, uh, the couplers usually operate in the linear regime. Okay, so now, first of all, the system of the uh, equations for this case. So as we discussed it more than once, the propagation of light in the optical fiber in the simplest case is uh, governed by the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Of course, under the condition, if the uh, group velocity dispersion in, in the fiber is anomalous, but this is a practically important case because in uh, standard optical fibers, the dispersion is indeed anomalous. Therefore, actually fibers may support solitons. So if you take a single fiber, uh, then the amplitude of the electromagnetic field in it is called U, and we have this familiar nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Z is the propagation distance along the fiber. Uh, tau, this is a so-called local time. Formally speaking, it plays the role of the coordinate, but physically, it's a combination, linear combination of the physical time and the propagation distance. And therefore, solitons, which can be supported by this system, by this uh, equation, they are called in optics, temporal solitons, because they, their structure is observed as a structure with respect to this temporal coordinate tau. Now, this is the usual cubic self-focusing term, the curve nonlinearity. Now we have uh, is, is the second equation for the second waveguide, which is just essentially the same equation with another uh, amplitude V instead of U. And now we have here the coupling terms. The coupling terms are linear with some effective coupling coefficient capital K. It's a constant, maybe positive or negative, doesn't matter. Uh, and, uh, why does it matter? If it is negative, we can just rewrite this 
system instead of V, we can introduce the other variable minus V. And then in terms of U and minus V, uh, K will become, instead of being negative, K will become positive. Therefore, we can assume that K is always positive. And this is the simplest possibility, which is practically important when we assume that the effect of tunneling is linear. And so uh, this means, in particular, in the first equation, that we have the term with lin which is linear with respect to V. V is the amplitude of the electromagnetic field from the second core, so some, um, some fragment of the uh, amplitude of the electromagnetic field from the second core can actually tunnel into the first core, and therefore it appears in terms of this linear term in the first core. And vice versa, we have the term with, which is linear with respect to the first amplitude in the second equation in the parallel core. So this is a system of two coupled, two coupled nonlinear Schrodinger equations. Now, uh, this model becomes quite popular and in, uh, theoretically, long ago, uh, many people actually st studied uh, what happens to solitons in this uh, dual core system. And what happens, it will, as we will have a chance to discuss, is the fact that, uh, of course, we can obviously have symmetric solitons when U and V are simply equal to each other. And we will have anti-symmetric solitons when V is minus U. Uh, but then, due to the presence of the nonlinearity in each core, a non-trivial fact is that we may have the spontaneous effect of the symmetry breaking. And uh, depending on the energy of the soliton, so again, effectively, depending on the strength of the nonlinearity, when the nonlinearity is, is strong enough, we will observe that the symmetric natural, so to say, obvious symmetric soliton will become unstable. It will be destabilized by the symmetry breaking effect. And as a stable solution, it will be replaced by a new soliton, which non-trivial one, which will be asymmetric. Asymmetric, it will mean that it will have different amplitudes in the components U and V. So we will have a chance to see this today still. We have enough time for that. And then, so theoretically, uh, this uh, this uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking of solitons in the dual core fibers was studied long ago, as a matter of fact, so even more than 30 years ago in a number of, of works. But experimentally, it, remained, it, it was not observed uh, at that time. It's not not because the, the not not because the experiment is very difficult. Somehow experimenters were not very much interested in this, and the direct experimental observation of the spontaneous symmetry breaking of the optical soliton in the dual core fiber was reported only relatively recently in this particular work. Okay, now let us proceed first of all to the analytical approximation. So, if we want to First of all, to try to predict some analytical results, uh, we can again, so we cannot uh, produce an exact analytical solution for the asymmetric soliton. This is our objective. Of course, for the symmetric soliton, these equations will be simply equivalent to the traditional classical nonlinear Schrodinger equations. So we know all the soliton solutions, but it's obvious. What is not obvious is how. If, if the asymmetric soliton with unequal amplitudes may exist, how to construct it? There is no possibility to do it exactly, but we can once again apply the variation approximation. First of all, this is the ansatz. So we take two components, U and V. So we want to, to look for the stationary solution. Therefore, we assume that the dependence on Z is actually uh, factorized in, in terms of this obvious um, uh, phase factor. So we P. This is what is called the propagation constant or wave number. Then A is the common amplitude of this soliton. And then we introduce this um, parameter theta. Parameter theta obviously determines the possible asymmetry. If theta is equal to pi over four, obviously both components will be equal to each other. But for values of theta different from pi over four, we will have the difference in their amplitudes. So we will have an asymmetric soliton, if it may exist. And of course, because it's a soliton, it must be also a function of, of the function of the temporal coordinate tau. So here, the simplest possibility is to assume that this temporal shape is exactly the same 
as in the classical solid tones for the single non-energy algebraic equation represented by hyperbolic secant. And W is another variational parameter which determines the width. What is essential, actually, is a comparison with the numerical solutions demonstrates when as we have the linear coupling between the two equations, <coughs> the amplitudes of this, of this asymmetric solid tone may be quite different, but the, width, the temporal width with respect to coordinate tau is essentially the same. Why it's essentially the same? Because this is, a, this is, as a matter of fact, dictated by the linear coupling, because roughly speaking, if we have the particular width of the U component, through this term, it will also impose essentially the same width onto the V component, which is a linear mixing between them. Okay, therefore, this is the answer when we have different amplitudes of the two components, but identical widths. And then we have this, one can produce uh, some um, pre predictions. So first of all, one can define the total energy of this uh, soliton. Uh, this is exactly the same, which was already uh, mentioned today, but under the name of norm in another context. So this is essentially the quadratic norm or in, ter in terms of for temporal solitons and fiber optics, it's, it's essentially the energy of this light signal. And in terms of the ansatz, it, it takes a simple expression in terms of the amplitude and W. So the asymmetry parameter is introduced in such a way that the total energy does not depend on it. But then we can explicitly introduce the asymmetry parameter. So today it was already introduced in a different context. Maybe we can for a moment jump back to recollect it. So the uh, sorry, the, uh, there was this. This was the definition of the asymmetry parameter. Now we have essentially the same definition. So what we do, we separately calculate the energy of each component of this soliton, and then the asymmetry is defined exactly as before. The difference difference between the two energies divided for the uh, for the sake of rescaling by the uh, total energy. So in terms of the answers, it will be easy to see, it will be cosine of two theta. So once again, the theta equal to pi over four, cosine of pi over two is zero. So for the, for the, for the symmetric soliton, we have uh, z zero value of the symmetry parameter, yeah. but for other values, yes. Is a question? No, okay. No, 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 no. Okay, so for theta equal to pi over four, uh, formally speaking, we have indeed zero as it should be. And for different values of theta, we have non-zero value of this asymmetry parameter, okay? And now as we can uh, proceed with this uh, machinery of the variation approximation, calculate the Lagrangian, write the Euler-Lagrange equations for the parameters. We can skip this technical part because it's actually uh, will be uh, rather boring and will take long time and we can just demonstrate the result. As the result is shown once again by means of the diagram which illustrates the spontaneous symmetry greatly. Now, what we show here. So this is what is shown here is actually completely the prediction of the variation approximation. At this moment, the numerical results are not shown, only the prediction of the variation approximation. And what we see in this prediction. So this is, as, as a control parameter, we have the total energy. So once again, as energy increases, obviously the nonlinearity becomes stronger. And then we should expect that some non-trivial phenomenon may happen when the energy will become sufficiently large. For, for convenience, for, uh, uh, the energy scaled by dividing it by the natural scale of energy, the square root of this coupling constant K in the system of coupled equations. As a matter of fact, it's possible to apply the additional scaling and simply say that, it simply said that k is equal to, to one. Okay, so this is the energy and this is cosine of two theta. So right, just a minute ago, I said cosine of two theta is the measure of the asymmetry. Now, for the values of energy between zero and this critical value, we have the continuous line of the asymmetry equal to zero. So here we have obvious symmetric solutions, obvious symmetric solitons, and they are completely stable. Now at this critical point, the spontaneous symmetry breaking bifurcation happens. First of all, what it does, it, it actually, it uh, destabilizes the symmetric solitons. Of course, the symmetric solution does not uh, disappear 
it actually extends beyond this point, but it extends as a shown by the dashed line as an unstable solution. Uh, now, also similar to what we discussed already in the previous model, at this point simultaneously, a new asymmetric solution appears. Also, it was mentioned already today that if we want to, to plot the full diagram, we should plot actually both positive and negative values of the asymmetry parameter. Simply one is the mirror image of the other. So in principle, it's enough to look only at, at the, for example, top half of this diagram, but maybe for the, for it's actually more convenient to see simultaneously the same diagram for the mirror image state. Okay, and then what is now, what is different from the previous picture that we discussed today? Previously, we had a similar diagram of the spontaneous symmetry grating. However, as we can see it as a matter of fact, as we can see it as a matter of fact here, yes. In this simple picture, what we saw, we saw that this is what is called the forward bifurcation diagram or sometimes supercritical. And this means that after this point, we have the new branch of the asymmetric solution. And as we keep increasing n, this branch goes forward. Therefore, it's called the forward bifurcation or also it's called the supercritical bifurcation. Supercritical because the non-trivial solution appears at values of n which exceed the critical value. So, so it, uh, it is a non-trivial solution, asymmetric one exists in the supercritical region. Now here, for the current model of the dual core optical fiber, the character of the bifurcation is really different. So it is, a, of course, again, the symmetry breaking bifurcation, but it's a different type of the symmetry breaking. Namely, what we see uh, immediately at this point, we have the appearance of this asymmetric branch, but it, go, it does not go, originally it does not go forward. Originally, it prefers to go backward. It means that um, actually we may have in some narrow region of the energy, we may have, uh, when still the symmetric solution is stable, the asymmetric solution already exists, which means that we have some narrow subcritical region. Subcritical means at the energy smaller than this particular critical value at which we already may have an asymmetric, non-trivial asymmetric solution. For this reason, this by bifurcation diagram is called subcritical. The entire actually, the entire setting is called subcritical. And also there is another name, the same bifurcation diagram sometimes is called the backward bifurcation for an obvious reason, because this time the new branch of asymmetric solutions first goes not forward, but backward. And then it, it, it can be found and um, demonstrated in particular by means of the relational approximation, but also numerically, it can be verified that as long as the branch of the asymmetric solutions is going backward, it is unstable. Therefore, you can see that this segment is shown by the dashed line. However, uh, this region of the, um, where we have the subcritical solutions is quite narrow. So where, then if we follow the evolution of this family, it actually uh, reaches this particular turning point and the turning point, it actually turns in the forward direction here. And then uh, it simultaneously, it becomes stable. So this is a point of the turning point provides for the stabilization of the asymmetric solution. And uh, the variation approximation predicts particular values of the, uh, first of all, it predicts a particular value of this point, it's called E uh, asymmetric of this particular value of the energy when for the first time, the asymmetric solutions appear sub subcritically. And also it predicts uh, this uh, critical value of E slightly larger value. So you can see that here is a factor is 5.51, here 5.33. So indeed, uh, <clears throat> Uh, um, 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 yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, what is, uh, it should be said exactly in the opposite way. The uh, um, um, the um, for the first time, the subcritical solution appears. It 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 it, it appears at uh, this point 
uh, where the energy is slightly smaller than the critical value at, at the point where we have the destabilization of the symmetric solution. So this, we can say that in this narrow interval of the energies, we have the effect which is called bistability. In this region, we simultaneously have two different stable solutions. The symmetric solution is still stable, but we already have the new uh, asymmetric solution, which is, which is also stable. Strictly speaking, it may be also even called not bistability, but tristability. Why tristability? Because together with this asymmetric solution, we have its mirror image here. So it means that if we have spontaneously larger energy in one core, uh, then in the other, we of course we also have the another solution when exactly in the opposite core we have the larger energy. So we, which particular core will be chosen by the system to uh, have a larger energy in it? It's simply uh, accidentally chosen by the initial perturbation. Okay. So uh, what is concerns technical aspects of this analysis? What should be mentioned that this is a so this is a, this is a prediction of the variation approximation for this critical value of the point. Uh, this is a <clears throat> this is a critical value of the point. Okay, so okay, let, let so let, let me again say it in a consistent form. Okay, this is. Uh, uh, this is this is the point actually. Th this value of energy corresponds to this point where, for the first time, we have the creation uh, of the subcritical asymmetric states. Next, we have this critical value of the energy. The critical uh, value of the energy is also predicted by the variation approximation and given by this value. Now, what we can do. We can compare, first of all, these two values. As we see that indeed this value for, is actually written for the square of the energy. This value for the square of the energy, six, is slightly larger than this value at, at, the, at that point. So it means that indeed, as shown in, the, in this diagram, the destabilization of the symmetric state happens later. It's a slightly larger energy than we have the chance to create the asymmetric subcritical solution. Now, what also is interesting, uh, this point of the, this critical value of the energy where I have the destabilization of the stable state can be found in the exact analytical form without any approximation. Why it's possible? It's possible because uh, how can we predict the destabilization? We should take the exact symmetric solution. The exact symmetric solution, of course, is available as the exact one because it's simply the classical nonlinear Schrodinger soliton. Then we should write the, if we want to um, to accurately study the stability problem, we should linear. We should write the linearized equations for small perturbations around this exact stationary solutions. And then, carefully looking at these linearized equations, one can actually uh, one may have a possibility to find the exact solution uh, for the, for the, uh, for, of, of this linearized system, which signalizes the onset of the instability. So this is a specific exact solution at which the instability growth rate is exactly equal to zero, which means that this is a the critical point at which instability is going to emerge, to appear. So this, uh, now we can actually see. The, uh, the critical value predicted for the square of the energy predicted by the variation approximation is six. The K can be simply set equal to one, six. And the exact analytical solution is 5.33. So it means that actually there is some discrepancy between the variation approximation and the exact numerical result for the critical point, but it is not large. So it's actually here is the reason that in terms of the squared energy, the relative error of the variational approximation is about 10%, a little bit more than approximately 10%. Okay, uh, <clears throat> now another ramification of this topic. We can, this time we can look at this system. This system represents a rather popular topic, which is called parity time or PT symmetry. So um, when we looked at the previous model based on this system of coupled equations, uh, of course, this system is completely conservative. 
it can be derived from its Hamiltonian. It also has its Lagrangian, and the Lagrangian in particular was used to develop the variation approximation. Now, the parity time symmetric system is, in, uh, strictly speaking, a, a dissipative system, but a very special kind of the dissipative system when actually it has, it includes uh, symmetrically placed dissipation uh, or loss and amplification or gain, so that uh, they are placed uh, symmetrically with respect to each other and the strengths are exactly equal. So we have some amount of loss placed at one point and some um, exactly the same amount of gain placed at the mirror image of that point. So such a, a dissipative system with a mutually balanced but separated spatially separated gain and loss, they are called PT symmetric or parity time symmetric uh, systems. For the first time, this concept was introduced, so to say, purely theoretically in quantum mechanics, where actually experimentally it was not realized, but later it was understood that it can be implemented in optics. In optics, in particular in the case of the dual core fiber, it's rather easy to implement it because we can take again our dual core configuration, but now we can assume in addition to that, that one core carries gain. So the gain is represented here by the positive coefficient gamma. If we just look at this evolution term and compare to the gain term, and this is term contains U, this is also a tax upon U, we see that this term by itself, of course, will immediately give rise to the exponential growth of any perturbation. Uh, with the growth rate gamma. Simultaneously, we assume in, in that in the parallel core, we have uh, the loss, the dissipative term with coefficient minus gamma. And they are still coupled linearly by the same pair of terms as we discussed before. Now here, a non-trivial problem is, uh, uh, first of all, actually we uh, now, only PT symmetric solitons can exist. In this case, it's quite obvious that unlike what we discussed a few minutes ago, we, we should not exist the existence of asymmetric solitons. For what reason? If we have different energies of solitons in the two components, it's obvious that then, for example, if we have larger energy in this active core where we have the action of the gain, the result of the, the rate of energy supply from the, from the gain will be definitely is larger than the rate of the energy loss in the parallel core, therefore the system will blow up essentially. It will start to, uh, to uh, pump energy into itself um, exponentially. Or uh, um, on the other hand, if we have uh, larger energy in the dissipative core, then the system will start to continuously lose its energy. Uh, for this reason, the asymmetric soliton cannot exist. Now, what is not trivial here, is to study the stability of the PT symmetric soliton, which has equal energies as the both components, but its stability is not obvious. Why is not obvious? Because obviously the presence of the gain in one core uh, actually is a drive for the instability. Uh, on the other hand, we have here the, the loss term, which can try to suppress the instability. So what may happen, qualitatively speaking, we may have some small perturbation. For example, the small perturbation will be amplified by the gain in this active core. However, this growing perturbation will simultaneously have a chance to tunnel through the linear coupling from the first core into the second core. In the second core, it will be suppressed. Essentially, it will be killed by the loss. And therefore, uh, it, it's not obvious what will happen. Um, if uh, the presence of the gain, which drives the growth of the perturbation in the uh, active core will be enough to destabilize the system, or maybe this coupling and the possibility to suppress the, uh, the growing perturbation by actually transferring them into the dissipative core and killing them there, maybe it will be sufficient to stabilize the system. So this um, non-trivial problem admits an exact analytical solution. I will not actually uh, and tell you in detail how it could be obtained, but just uh, it, 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 it was possible to solve it exactly analytically. Well, of course, it is analyt the exact analytical solution was based on the analysis of the linearized equations for small perturbations. So what was done, first of all, the PT symmetric solitons can be easily find, found in the exact analytical form. Then what is non-trivial 
uh, one should derive a system of linearized equations for small perturbations. And then fortunately in this particular model, it's possible to provide an exact solution of those linearized equations, which account, a particular exact solution, which account for the onset of the instability. And the final result is written here. Uh, the, um, the final result is written here, and the final result is that uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, uh, uh, this, 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 uh, this PT symmetric solutions, uh, solitons, remain stable as long as the squared energy, squared energy is smaller than this particular, particular uh, critical value. So if gamma is equal to zero, we don't have new terms. It will be exactly the same uh, criterion for the stability of symmetric solitons, which we discussed a couple of minutes ago in the dual core uh, fiber. Now, if we introduce gamma, we see that now the critical energy above which this, the soliton becomes unstable start, becomes smaller because this factor is smaller than one. Still, we have, in, in spite of the presence of the gain and loss, we still have the stability region, provided that gamma is smaller than one. But when gamma is smaller than one, what it means that physically speaking, if gamma is larger than one, it means that eventually the gain and loss factors become stronger than the linear coupling. So as long as linear coupling is stronger, we still have some stability region. But when gamma becomes larger than one, uh, the coupling is no longer able to suppress the instability and then the solitons become completely unstable. But the, the conclusion is that uh, Above this critical value, we have uh, still the stability region for the PT symmetric solitons, which is quite a non trivial uh, result. And it was also verified by direct numerical simulations. And once again, let us stress that uh, when the uh, PT symmetry is broken, in particular when gamma is larger than one, so that uh, we, can, we are no longer able to support the PT symmetry of the solitons, the this uh, unstable PT symmetric solitons are not replaced by any asymmetric solitons. This is unlike what we discussed before, because in this case, when the PT symmetry is broken, the system actually blows up. We, then we will observe the exponential growth of the instability. Okay, so this is the end of the, part of the particular uh, discussion of the uh, dual core optical fiber, and it also included the discussion of its parity time symmetric generalization. Now we will have a new particular topic which still belongs to the general scene of the spontaneous symmetry breaking. And this will be the spontaneous symmetry breaking in the case of the double well potential. So today the question was asked and now we, in principle, we will have a chance to, to proceed to the discussion of this, of this situation. However, I'm afraid today we, we have only one minute for that. Okay, let me just very briefly mention that, we'll, 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 what, that what will we do? We will now consider this particular model with a double well potential. So we see that this will be the two dimensional system as a matter of fact, with this quasi one dimensional traffic potential. And we see the potential consists actually of two uh, rectangular potential wells which are separated by some distance, but the distance is finite, which means that the wave function will be able to tunnel across the barrier from one uh, rectangular potential well to the other and in the opposite direction. So this, uh, let me, the last things to, to mention today, maybe just to show the equation, which will describe this model. So this will be the two dimensional nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Once again, the sign plus here implies its self attraction which can create solitons, but then a quite an untrivial problem will be the stability of, of two-dimensional solitons in this model. And U of X is exactly this double well potential, which is formally introduced here, but it's actually was introduced in the obvious form by means of this simple diagram. Okay, so the, the just the, really the last thing to mention is that what we will try to do, first of all, we will try to find stationary solutions in this obvious form. It's written in the, actually the notation is written as for the Bose-Einstein condensates. So mu may be called the chemical potential because the model, this two dimensional model is relevant to principle for the Bose-Einstein condensates. 
And then we will have to, we will have to try somehow to solve the stationary equation, and we will be interested in soliton solutions, which are localized. And then we will try to see if uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking will be we will be able to predict the spontaneous symmetry breaking for this for these two dimensional solitons. And symmetry breaking will should happen between uh, the parts of the wave function, which are which is trapped in these two. Uh, potential wells. So, um, Emmanuel, I, I, I believe I must stop here.